Okay, cool. Let's get started. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers of uh, this very cool workshop or symposium uh, for inviting me. My name is Jeremy Freeman and I'm going to be talking about carving up the ventral stream. This is a flattened representation of the macaque visual cortex and I think the reason most of us are here and arguably the reason we do neuroscience is because we want to know how this big piece of meat takes information in the outside world and turns it into something that is behaviorally relevant and useful. In the case of the visual system, which I'm highlighting here by indicating all the different visual areas and different colors, the dominant paradigm for doing this, as put very eloquently by Kendrick, is to basically march along different areas and characterize the selectivity of neurons, uh, specifically the kinds of visual features that they seem to care about or respond to. Uh, in early areas like the retina or primary visual cortex, V1, this has been relatively straightforward, uh, relatively. Uh, neurons seem to care about either local contrast or not just the presence of contrast but the shape in the case of orientation selectivity. Uh, there's also been a lot of really nice progress uh, in later areas like infratemporal cortex or IT characterizing neurons as selective to particular everyday objects. Um, I think the areas in between, in particular V2 and V4, have been quite a bit more difficult to figure out. And by difficult, I mean we have had trouble finding stimuli that reliably differentiate responses in these areas from responses in other areas. Uh, I would say V2 has been particularly enigmatic in this regard. Um, one example of the kind of thing that was had been done or has been done in V2 for quite some time is to assume that its neurons respond differentially to to stimulate that look kind of like these. Uh, little cartoon uh, things that look like the bits and pieces of the objects that we see in the world. And I think uh, Kendrick put it really eloquently that one of the concerns about this kind of approach is that it puts a little too much emphasis on the way we think our visual system works, which might not actually be how it works. Uh, and stimuli like these, uh, by and large, have failed to robustly differentiate responses in, say, area V2 compared to V1. So to make that idea a little more explicit, I think it's worth taking a look at what's actually out there in the world and see whether these kinds of things show up. In the case of uh, what we call human-made environments, uh, this is a picture of my favorite coffee shop from Brooklyn, um, we see that those kinds of little bits and pieces of objects do in fact show up. For example, uh, marking out the edges of the table or the top of a coffee mug. Um, but most of the image actually isn't these things. It's this kind of stuff that makes up everything else. The texture of the wall, of the paper, of the table, of the corrugated cardboard. Uh, and it's worth emphasizing this is true for a human-made environment. If we go to my new surroundings in Northern Virginia where it's really just a lot of trees, uh, basically everything is made up of stuff. All we see around us are sort of patterns and textures and the various things that make up, quote unquote, the natural world. The challenge of taking this idea and using these kinds of image properties as stimuli in experiments and actually using them to characterize the visual system is that it's very hard to know how to represent these things. If I have a little corner or an edge, I know how to manipulate it and parameterize it. In the case of these kinds of stimuli, that's quite a bit harder. But that's exactly what we uh, have been working on. And we did that originally by turning to some really nice work in computer graphics and image statistics for how to represent represent homogeneous natural texture images and not just how to represent them but how to synthesize them. So I want to walk with, through with you how that works. The idea is to start with some image, some natural pattern like shown in the upper left and I'm going to walk through the idea of representing that pattern and then synthesizing a new image that's matched for that representation. So if we do that with a simple kind of representation of overall orientation spatial frequency content akin to what might be present in V1, we can compute a bunch of responses like that, sort of orientation spatial frequency, and then take an image of random noise and iteratively adjust the noise so that it matches the output of that representation. Hmm? The output of that representation as applied to the original image. Uh, 
And when we do that, we synthesize a new image, which I'll call spectral noise, that has the same overall orientation and spatial frequency content of the original one, though you'll note that it lacks some of the more complex higher order structure. There are certain dependencies in this image in terms of the co-localization of different kinds of elements that are lost or sort of smeared together if we only represent the overall orientation and spatial frequency. We can capture a lot of those additional elements by adding a second stage to our representation that specifically computes correlations across different orientations, different positions, and different spatial frequencies. We can now repeat this synthesis procedure, except now we're going to generate an image that is additionally matched for the output of those higher order correlations. And what we find when we do this is an image that I'll call a naturalistic texture that has many of the more naturalistic features of the original one. The important, point to, uh, the important point to make is that we're not nowhere explicitly parameterizing that this thing has a bunch of corners in it that simply arises from a statistical representation that's well defined by the correlations that we're computing. We hypothesize that these higher order correlations might be related to what an area like V2 is representing. So to test that, we used the synthesis procedure to generate experimental stimuli. We made a family of different stimuli, each a pair of naturalistic and noise images that either do or do not have these higher order correlations as defined by our statistical model. We then presented these stimuli to anesthetized macaque monkeys in the paraphobia while recording the responses of individual neurons in V1 and V2. What we found, and I'm showing here just three representative examples, but we found very consistently neurons in V1 reliably uh, responded similarly to these different kinds of patterns. On the y-axis here is firing rate. On the x-axis is the time from stimulus onset. In the case of V1, the dark green are responses to the naturalistic stimuli, and the light green are responses to the noise stimuli. So for V1, those responses are similar. In the case of V2, there was a robust differential response to specifically the naturalistic stimuli. And we found that this basic effect reliably differentiated responses in V2 from responses in V1, better than any previous stimuli. Uh, so this is in macaque monkey. We uh, found we could see very similar effects by using fMRI in humans. To do this, we did an incredibly simple fMRI experiment in which we just presented alternating blocks of these naturalistic stimuli or these noise stimuli. I'm showing here a flattened representation of the occipital cortex indicating uh, what responses to these stimuli look like. The color here indicates the extent to which the bold response was modulated by the difference between naturalistic and noise. And the white lines indicate boundaries derived from independent retinotopic mapping. What I think you'll appreciate in this map is that V1 essentially has very little or no response. As soon as we cross over the border into V2, there's a robust response and it sort of lingers on and shows up in V3 and maybe to some extent V4 quite robustly. And in a separate set of experiments that I don't have time to describe, we've shown that these differential responses uh, in terms of how they vary across different image categories are very highly related or tightly related to humans' perception, psychophysically measured, of the same kinds of stimuli. So I think this work collectively has shown us that these higher order correlational statistics, even if they don't explain what V2 is doing, which I don't think they quite do yet, uh, they provide us a very good hint about what might be computed. But it's also important to stress that these particular statistics don't capture everything that's out there in the world and in visual images. And to show you that, I'm going to do the exact same synthesis procedure I described before, but instead I'm going to take an image that has actual things in it, in this case pictures of little kids' faces. And if we again generate our synthetic images, the spectral noise looks kind of like nothing, just clouds. And the texture, which I'll call a scene texture, has a lot of the same kind of appearances and textural properties of the original one, but certainly doesn't have any kids' faces in it. And if we do this over a number of images, we see that very consistently, the images generated or synthesized in this procedure have some of the same properties of the original, but don't actually have any of the kind of global organization or structure that make uh, these images have recognizable things in them. Uh, and I should say, this exact same manipulation was used in a very elegant set of studies uh, by Rustin DiCarlo, uh, which I think are compatible with what I'm about to show you. 
So in a series of follow-up fMRI experiments, we have done essentially the same thing we did to differentiate V2 from V1, but now additionally include these kinds of stimuli and make a variety of comparisons in the same subjects. So just to show you uh, the results of that, if we first compare responses between these uh, intact scene images and these images of spectral noise, what we see is that indeed there is some of that V2, V1 difference that we saw with the textures, but in some, some, in some sense it's dwarfed by much more robust responses in downstream areas. And I think this is broadly consistent with a variety of fMRI studies that have compared responses to intact objects and either scrambled or spectrally matched noise. Uh, now, what's cool about having all of these stimuli at our disposal is we can additionally do a comparison between these intact images in the same subject and these texturally matched images, which not only have the same spectral information, but also have some of those higher order statistics. And what we see in this case is that responses in V1, V2, and V3 essentially drop out. So these images which are matched for these higher order correlations yield no differential responses in V2. Uh, whereas we see, still see uh, effects or differential responses in these downstream areas. So if we look at all three of these things together, it suggests a surprisingly simple uh, demarcation or carving up of what these different stages of visual processing are doing. When we compare textures to noise, we see robust responses in V2 and V3, but not in V1, suggesting that whereas V1 cares about spectral information, V2 and V3 care about these higher order correlations. If we compare scenes versus noise, we see an overemphasis in downstream areas that we see some of that V2 differential response. And if we now match our images for those higher order correlations, these responses drop out and all we're left with are those responses downstream. So if this seems a little too simple, uh, that's because it is too simple. I've shown you that with these different kinds of controlled stimuli, we can uh, isolate or yield differential responses in different stages of visual processing. But I haven't actually told you what it is that these different areas are representing, what it means to actually represent these kinds of statistics. Uh, that's especially true in the case of these higher order areas downstream, where I think we have a very poor understanding of the statistical nature of uh, objects, if you like, or scenes that these areas might be encoding. Uh, I certainly don't have an answer for that, but I can at least give a suggestion, which is that in earlier areas, like V1 and V2, we found it very useful to take a statistical approach, that is to think about an area like V1 as representing spectral information, the statistics of the spectra, and in V2 representing these sort of textural statistics, and I think it might be interesting to think about areas even beyond downstream areas representing something like the statistics of form, as opposed to particularly little cartoon uh, faces or cartoon objects, which in some level we must probably be representing somewhere, somehow, uh, but as Kendrick said, that doesn't necessarily tell us how the brain is doing it, and maybe something statistical is a lot more uh, what the brain is actually doing. Um, I also want to highlight uh, another thought uh, I've had about this basic problem, which has really guided the work that I'm doing now, which is somewhat far from this system, uh, which is that the other thing that's changing as we move along here is the gradual increase in the behavioral relevance of these stimuli. I think one of the big advantages of using these naturalistic stimuli in V2 is that we looked out in the world and looked at the structure of images. And in some sense, the entire point of this pathway is to build up representation of things that we use and interact with in the world. And if I had to say what the most important question uh, in this field in general is, it's what is this all for? Are we really, are we asking what this is all for? Because the whole point of building up visual representations is to use them to interact and navigate a complex world. Uh, and that's quite different than looking at pictures on a screen, right? And what I think we need to address this uh, and to really address it in this totality is to ideally record from as much of the brain as possible, maybe all of it, uh, and to do this while animals perform complex behaviors that make use of uh, the kinds of stimuli that they're looking at and use them to guide behavior. Um, so as a very short teaser for what I do now, and I want to stress that this part of the talk is uh, not officially or officially not endorsed by my uh, former advisor, Tony Mopshin, uh, I believe at least right now, the best place to answer these kinds of questions are in systems other than the primate, in particular uh, the zebrafish and the mouse. Um, and this is work that I'm now doing uh, in very close collaborations with Misha Arns and Philip Keller and Carl Sabota. Uh, the advantage, the huge advantage of these systems
systems is that we can put both fish and mice into complex virtual environments in which they're presented with stimuli, in the case of the fish, visual, in the case of the mouse, visual, or in work we're doing, uh, somatosensory stimuli, and use either two photon imaging of the mouse or something called light sheet microscopy in the fish to record from very large fractions of the brain simultaneously while animals see stimuli and perform behaviors based on those stimuli, and we can look at the entire system while this happens. Uh, and just to give you one sort of teaser example in the case of the fish, uh, in these experiments the fish is viewing a pattern that's moving beneath him. It's like we're back in V1 because it's just an oriented grating, except simultaneously we're measuring a behavioral response that's induced by the stimulus, specifically moving this pattern underneath the fish causes him to swim. So in one experiment we can look at activity across the brain during a visually induced motor behavior where we're seeing the entire system at work. And what that activity looks like is shown here. This is an image of differential calcium responses. That's what the heat map shows across the entire fish brain. Just to orient you, the eyes are here and here, and the tail is out here. The stimulus was a grating that's drifting, and what I'm showing with the size of the circle is the strength of the animal's behavior. So basically, every time the stimulus comes on, there's this swath of activity across the brain, as well as uh, uh, different or swimming activity because he's behaving with his motor pattern in response to the stimulus. So I think this is a very powerful domain to start studying the entirety of visual processing in a context where it has behavioral relevance. Uh, and just as a final example, we can also do things like look at selectivity to the direction of motion, um, which while inducing uh, responses in the visual areas of the fish, the optic tectum, it also lights up pretty much the entire brain because we're looking at visual representation in the context of behavior. Uh, with that, I just want to end by thanking uh, all of my extremely close uh, collaborators and mentors at NYU who were involved in everything I talked about involving V2, Corey Zemba, Eros Michelli, Tony Movshin, and David Heger. I also want to thank my uh, more recent collaborators in the fish world, Misha Ahrens, Philip Keller, Nikita Vladimirov, Yumu, and Takashi Kawashima. Uh, and I want to thank NYU, Janalia, and HHMI. Uh, and as a final shameless plug, if you thought any of that fish stuff seemed cool, uh, I'm hiring, so come talk to me. Thank you.